Okay, if we could turn, please, in our Bibles to Judges chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 31 down into chapter 2, verse 11. And the subject matter this morning really is failure explained. And it's going to be explained in one word, Gilgal. Failure explained, Gilgal. So beginning in verse 31, it says, Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Halab, nor of Akzib, nor of Helba, nor of Aphik, nor of Rehob, but the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became tributaries unto them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres in Ijalon and in Shalbim, yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up to Akrabim from the rock and upwards. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal, to Bokim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bokim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Geash. And also, all that generation were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. Again, God will bless that reading of his word to us. And uh, I hope that this morning you'll get even a fraction of the blessing out of this study that I have personally enjoyed in this particular study, especially uh, when we get into chapter two. But we begin at, uh, closing off really chapter one, where we've been observing the little compromises and witnessing these compromises as they've been taking place and how uh, it just gets bigger and bigger. It starts with a small compromise, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we get to verse 31 and it says, neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko and uh, other places. And what we could say is this, that each tribe that failed made it easier for the other tribes to also fail. In other words, that there was a prevailing culture of failure. And so expectations were low and it became kind of normal. And I want to suggest to you that for many generations, it seems like we have been living 
in a culture of failure and decline as amongst the people of God. And it almost gets to the point that, well, that's the norm. That's the standard. And so expectations are low. And uh, who, who am I to make a difference kind of thing? And you get used to it. And that's what happened. They just they got used to failure. And they just thought this is this is normal. And I believe as you read the book of Acts, sometimes it shocks us. And we realize how abnormal our Christianity is when we co- compare it to what God intended. <laughs> and so certainly... We see here this culture of failure that prevails, and it, and it gets worse. In fact, the tribe of Asher sank to new depths because it says that not only did they not drive them out, but it says in verse 32, the Asherites dwelt amongst the Canaanites. And that's a subtle change. In, in past references in this chapter, the Canaanites have been allowed to dwell amongst the Israelites. But now it says... It's almost like the the very opposite. Uh, The tribe of Asher are now so disobedient that they dwelt amongst the Canaanites. Uh, They made no apparent effort to expel the Canaanites and allowed them to control what God had promised to give them, their land, their inheritance. And uh, what a letdown for the tribe of Asher. Uh, Again, we've been looking at Genesis 49 with some of these tribes and the things that were said of them, uh, and uh, how they've failed to live up, really, uh, to the prophetic statements that were said concerning them. And chapter 49, verse 20, about the tribe of Asher, it says, Out of Asher his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. And the idea was that they were given a very beautiful piece of land. And uh, uh, amongst God's inheritance, their land was was very fertile, very beautiful piece of land, and yet they they failed to take it. They failed to enjoy all the riches that should have been theirs by inheritance, and they exchanged kind of short-term gain because uh, they they were able to cause uh, the people, some of them to be tributaries among them, but they exchanged that uh, for giving up uh, an inheritance that was very precious. And so again, compromise once again. Verse 33, neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and the inhabitants of Beth Anath. Now, again, these two places are interesting uh, because we know Beth always is to do with house of, and Beth Shemesh uh, it literally is house of the sun. And many believe that it was actually a, a sanctuary uh, to the sun god. And so they, they basically failed uh, to drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, and they settled down, uh, again, with idolatry uh, that was prevalent in these areas, Beth Shemesh, uh, Beth Anath. Uh, again, Anath was a Canaanite goddess of war, and she was the consort and sister of Baal. And so, again, both of these places uh, speak, again, of, of basically shrines to, to pagan Canaanite deities, and the children of God just settled down with them and failed to drive them out and follow his command. Now, God never intended for Israel to conquer the land of Canaan easily. Uh, he tells us, Uh, For instance, let's just look back in Exodus, uh, for instance, chapter 23. Uh, It was never his intention that this would be a a quick fix issue. Uh, If you go to Exodus 23 and verse 29 and 30, you read this. It says, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. By little and little, I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. Uh, Again, very similar statement in Deuteronomy. We'll just read it just to see that God's original intent was uh, that they weren't, it wasn't going to be a quick fix here uh, because he wanted them to depend on him uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, Deuteronomy 7 22, it says, The Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little 
thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed, and he shall deliver their kings unto thy hand. Thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou have destroyed them. And so basically, God said, I'm going to give you the land and I'm going to give it to you little by little uh, so that, uh, you know, it doesn't cause devastation in the land that they'll still be planting of, and, and reaping of harvest and all that. I'll do it little by little. And, and so he intended it so that they would constantly be dependent on him in these frequent battles. But they failed to do it. They didn't drive out the inhabitants. And it's almost as if, as if Israel was saying, if I can't have it easy and all at once, I don't want it at all. They just didn't want the constant battle and the constant dependence that was required upon the Lord. And sometimes I think uh, we can get a bit like that too. We want it easy and we, we get tired of the battle and we don't, we don't, we don't want to be constantly fighting our spiritual enemies. And so it says, verse 34, it says, the Amorites uh, forced the children of Dan into the mountains. Again, the mountains, beautiful as they are, are not as, as productive as the fertile uh, plain, uh, which basically the Amorites took for themselves. They drove the tribe of Dan up into the mountains. So now, uh, instead of Israel driving the Canaanites out, the Canaanites are driving the tribe of Dan out of his inheritance up into the mountains. And eventually it led the tribe of Dan to give up altogether on their inheritance and to migrate north uh, to Laish. And when we get to Judges chapter 18, we'll see that. And again, we said chapter one is kind of laying the foundation for a lot of what we're going to see uh, in the rest of the book, uh, why was it that the tribe of Dan wandered up north looking for land? Well, it's because the Amorites wouldn't allow them to have their own land. They drove them out. And so, again, we see how this compromise started in a small way, but it's just gradually developed so that now the enemy is in the place of ascendancy and the people of God are in the place of weakness. And so it says, but the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres and Aijalon and in Shalbim, yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed. So they became tributaries. And the course of the Amorites was from going up of Akrabim from the rock and upwards. So again, they put them to tribute, but that's not what God told them to do. He told them to wipe them out and they failed. And so what dishonor to God uh, what sin is seen here to spare and to tolerate such people? As we read in Leviticus as why they, the land was spewing them out, how wicked these people were, and how God had said they, they're to be wiped out. And these people failed in that. What we fail to understand is that God is perpetually at war with sin. And that's the whole explanation of the extermination of the Canaanites. A kind of a buzzword of our generation is hate crime. Uh, you've heard that. I just heard the other day a lady in Finland, former member of the Finnish parliament, is uh, on trial for a hate crime. And what she did was she texted a Bible verse to her church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Now, just think about this. She texts a, ver a Bible verse to a church, and she's now being prosecuted for hate crime. The verse from, was from the book of Romans, and the reason she sent it to a church is that the evangelical Lutherans had sponsored a gay pride parade. Can you imagine that? Evangelical Lutheran, the church of Martin Luther, sponsoring a gay pride parade, and she sent a text from the book of Romans. You know what it is, all right? It's, it's clearly explaining what God thinks about these things. And she is now on trial for a hate crime. Now, let me just say this. God hates sin. Let me just say that. He hates sin with a passionate hatred. And so uh, we, we've got to be honest with the text of Scripture. And sin, 
has consequences. And part of the consequence of sin is God's judgment upon it. And God had uh, allowed uh, 400 years for the iniquity of the Amorites to fully develop because he's long-suffering. And we see his long-suffering in Rahab the harlot and her conversion. But the time had come for judgment to fall. And the children of Israel, who were supposed to be God's instrument in bringing this judgment, failed miserably. And so they were unfaithful toward God. They were indifferent about evil, the thing that God hated. And they just kind of settled down and they became used to it. And there's a great danger of a seductive form of passivism uh, in the Christian life, which ignores the reality of the spiritual battle that is so clearly described in the word of God. Ephesians 6 talks about the fact that we're in a battle. The book of Judges illustrates uh, to us the battle we're in. And this pacifist attitude makes peace with the devil and happily does so uh, and says, I'm not going to harm your interests if you leave me alone. And so what happens is we settle down in a culture of sin and we fail to become aggressive in taking the message. Because, because if we do, we were talking about this at our Bible reading the other night. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. I read about Brother Dale and some of the things that happened to him in Edmonton and uh, equipment stolen, people trying to knife him, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, there's great opposition. And, um, and who wants that? Uh, we, it's, it's easier just to stay mute and say nothing and settle down with a culture of sin rather than being aggressive with the gospel. God delivers us from a Christian pacifism that just accepts the prevailing culture and does nothing about it and doesn't speak the message of the gospel. God, give us boldness in our generation to take the sword, not the sword that's found in the book of Joshua and Judges, but the sword of the Spirit, and go on the offensive and deliver us from becoming comfortable with our generation. And so as we kind of summarize this chapter, it, it, it's one of, we said, compromise. It begins with one man being spared. If you remember uh, this king uh, that they, uh, they chopped off his big toes and, and his, uh, his thumbs, but they didn't kill him, which they were told to do. Then a family was spared, uh, the family that showed them uh, the way in uh, to, the, to the city. And eventually, whole Canaanite tribes were spared. And slowly but surely, compromise grew, and it always does. Little compromises is where it begins, and then they become bigger, and they become bigger. And we might ask ourselves, am I allowing questionable things, things that at one time I would have had nothing to do with, but now I'm kind of allowing them back in and giving room for them. Now we get to chapter two. This, I believe, is the exciting part uh, of this study. And uh, it's where God is explaining the failure in the previous chapter. And in the first five verses, we're going to see that the, the angel of the Lord comes and rebukes them. But inherent in this is an explanation of why they had failed. And so this increasing weakness of the people, how they gradually surrendered more and more to the enemy, we're told really the secret to the whole thing here in chapter 2. And it's all down to this word Gilgal. Notice it says, and an angel of the Lord, perhaps more correctly, the angel of the Lord. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but I, have, I am utterly convinced that this is a Christophany, uh, this is Christ appearing, and we'll explain that in a moment, but uh, it's a pre-incarnate uh, revelation of the person of the Lord Jesus. Uh, it says, an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. Now, notice where he comes from. 
he comes from Gilgal. In other words, that's, that's clearly where he was before he came to them to bulk him. And so Gilgal is quite significant. If you read carefully the book of Joshua, you'll notice the secret of their victories was that they continued after every conflict except one to go back to Gilgal. So they'd go, they would have their incursion, they'd win the battle, they'd go back to Gilgal. So what's the significance of this place, Gilgal? Certainly, it's mentioned numerous times in Joshua. It's only mentioned twice in the book of Judges. And it would seem to be a failure to go back to Gilgal that explains all of their weakness. Yes, they'd had some victories, but they were, they were all tainted by, by weakness. See, Gilgal was the place of circumcision. If you remember when they crossed the Jordan, and the first act after crossing the Jordan, remember they took out 12 stones, they made a heap of stones to remind them that they crossed Jordan. They then had a, a mass circumcision <laughs> of, uh, of all the men uh, of the nation. And um, it's, it's a beautiful picture, this circumcision. It's the place of unsparing self-judgment and the cutting off of the flesh. That's what Gilgal pictures. It's to cut off in unsparing self-judgment judgment, anything connected with the flesh. So, And the flesh is that evil element in us that opposes God's work in our lives. And we need to constantly return to Gilgal, right, to that place of cutting off the flesh because the flesh tends to continue to grow and develop. And so this change from Gilgal to Bokim, I like this. This is a statement from John Nelson Darby's synopsis uh, of the books of the Bible in concerning judges. He says this, this change from Gilgal to Bokim is the key to the book. It is so, alas, but too often the condition of God's children. In other words, we go easy on the flesh. And we'll see that bokim means weeping or weepers. And because of our failure to be ruthless with the flesh, it brings us ultimately to a place of weeping <laughs> because of defeat and all that goes along with allowing the flesh to have the ascendancy. And so Gilgal had been a very important and significant place throughout the book of Joshua. It was the place of his presence. It tells us that the camp of Israel was at Gilgal. And of course, you remember when they, when they set up the camp, what was the first place that was put up? It was the tabernacle. So the first place the tabernacle was in the promised land was where the camp was, which was Gilgal. And that's where the presence, the angel of his presence was, right? And so that's why the Lord comes from Gilgal up to Bokim, because it was the place of his presence. It was the place of blessing. It was the place of victory. Uh, because, again, they, it was a place where they had, in a sense, celebrated victory over their enemies. A rolling away of the reproach of Egypt. Remember, they'd been slaves in Egypt and they had uh, been in bondage and they couldn't practice uh, their faith properly. That generation that had wandered in the wilderness had not been circumcised. And so it was a place of, of victory. It represented the, the end of the old life of slavery to the flesh being put behind us and a new life, a resurrection life. Because you remember crossing Jordan is a picture of that death, burial, and resurrection. It's a putting away of the flesh, that circumcision, and a uh, leaving behind that old life and the beginning of a new life, resurrection life, a life of holiness to the Lord. And if Gilgal is characteristic of the book of Joshua, Bolkin is characteristic of the book of Judges. <laughs> 
because we're going to see there's going to be a lot of weeping in the book of Judges because the flesh is allowed to have its ascendancy again and they fail to go back to Gilgal. Now, Gilgal, if Vulcan has the idea of uh, weeping, Gilgal has several meanings attached to that word. Uh, it means a circle of stones and perhaps uh, related to the this, this, this 12 stones, it, it, it has the idea of a wheel and it has the idea of a rolling away, a rolling away. And of course, that's why they said Gilgal is a place where the reproach of Egypt was rolled away from the children of Israel. It was, it was there, as we've said, that the Lord told Joshua to make sharp knives and to circumcise that new generation that were born in the wilderness. And you think about it, it was a great act of faith. They've just crossed into the enemy territory, in a sense. It's their land. It's the land of promise, but the Canaanites are there. And their first act is would almost seem like military suicide to actually circumcise all your males. What is, how does that work in terms of their ability to fight? Well, you, you ask the men of Shechem, and they will tell you the story of how weakening it is to circumcise all your males. Remember, Simeon and Levi, just two guys, were able to wipe out the men of Shechem because they'd all agreed to be circumcised. And so it was a tremendous act of faith on their part in, in what was still enemy territory, was their promised land, but to cut off this symbol of the flesh uh, and to do it in complete faith in the Lord that he would protect them. And he did. He put the fear uh, of, of him upon their enemies, and they didn't do anything. They didn't attack at that time. It was also the place where the, they kept the Passover for the first time. Now, all this is in Joshua 5, and I'm not going to keep going back and reading from Joshua 5, but if you want a homework assignment, you might read over Joshua uh, actually from chapter 4, verse 20, all the way through chapter 5, and you'll read about the significance of Gilgal. But what we're saying is uh, that it was a place where they first kept the Passover in the promised land as well. Not only circumcision had taken place, but there was this Passover feast. It was a time of remembrance, of calling to mind uh, the victory that had been given to them through the Lamb. It was a place of memorial stones as well, a place of remembering God's great act of deliverance in bringing them through, as it were, on resurrection ground. Uh, so it was a, a tremendous place. It was a place where Joshua met the captain of the Lord of hosts. And he said, are you for us or against us? <laughs> and and uh, uh, he asserted that uh, actually he was the captain. That was the big statement that's made there. And so what we're saying is it's a lack of going back to Gilgal was the cause of all of their weakness. In the book of Joshua, every time they went and won a victory, except once in chapter 7, after they had defeated Jericho, they didn't go back to Gilgal. And that's when they, made, they lost the battle to Ai, a failure to go back to Gilgal. The only time that they were really defeated was that when they failed to go back to Gilgal. And we see again in the book of Judges, they failed to go back to Gilgal. Now, Paul in the New Testament would take up this topic of circumcision. And uh, I just want to read a couple of verses that are very pertinent as we consider Gilgal and its significance. Philippians chapter 3, in verse 3. He says, we are the circumcision. It was, he's talking about these that wanted to put the physical act of circumcision and make, in a sense, Jews out of God's people in Philippi. But he's saying, we're the true circumcision, which worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus. And then notice this last phrase, and have no confidence in the flesh. And that's the spiritual significance, really, of circumcision. It's a picture of putting away the flesh. And a true believer is somebody who worships God 
in the spirit. The spirit of God plays a significant part in their service and their walk with him. They rejoice in Christ Jesus, and they have absolutely no confidence in the flesh. And brethren, most of our problems today in assembly testimony is the flesh. Our failure to be ruthless with the flesh. And, and oh, so many difficulties. It's just the flesh. You see it so prevalent amongst the people of God. A lack of spirit-filled Christianity and the flesh dominating. And it's this failure to go to Gilgal. Look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2.11. And we'll make some statements concerning this in a moment as we go on. But Colossians 2.11, it says... Speaking of the Lord Jesus in, in verse 10, in, you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And it's, it's basically what Paul is doing is taking them back to their conversion when their spiritual circumcision took place. When we get converted, we're done with it. We're sick of the flesh, right? We're, we see what it is. We see where it leads. It leads us to, uh, to despair. We go to Calvary and we say, I'm done with that old life. I'm done with that, uh, that way of living. I don't want to go there anymore. And w- at that point, we're just sick of the flesh. We just want something new and different and real. And we go to the cross. And it's a picture of the cutting away of the flesh. Now, we'll pick it up again in a moment, but I want to go back to chapter 2 in verse 1 because we've got to keep coming back to Gilgal in this, this lesson. We've got to massage it in so we get the message of Gilgal. But in, in, I wanted to mention about the angel of the Lord. So in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, An angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bokim and said, Now, I want you to notice, I, I made the statement and quite dogmatically and unapologetically, that I believe that this is the angel of the Lord, which is the pre-incarnate revelation of the eternal Son of God. Okay, And the reason I say that is this angel makes the claim here, notice the personal pronoun, that he is the one that delivered them out of Egypt. So notice just the language here. The angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bokim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto this land, which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Right. So clearly it's the angel that's been referred to that's done all this for them. And when we look at verse 12, I think it makes it very clear that this is uh clearly speaking of a divine person because verse 12 says they forsook the lord god of their fathers which brought them up out of the land of egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people so the lord god of their fathers which brought them up out of the land of egypt and yet here the angel of the lord says i made you go up out of egypt okay so so clearly it's a divine person a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that there there are three occasions in the book of Judges where we have these Christophanies. Now, the reason I say a Christophany as opposed to theophany, because it it is a divine person, no question. But I believe that the Lord Jesus has ever been the one who has revealed the Father, right? Uh, God, who is spirit, is invisible. But the one who reveals God to us is always the second person, the eternal son of God. And so that's why I'm saying Christophany, although it clearly is a theophany as well. It's a divine person. But it's three appearances in Judges. We'll mention them. We're going to look at them in detail as we go. In chapter 6, verse 11, uh, the angel of the Lord will appear to Gideon. In chapter 13 and verse 3, Again, the angel of the Lord will appear to Manoah uh, and, uh, again, the parents, basically, of Samson. And each time, I believe it is 
the eternal son, the pre-incarnate son of God who is appearing. And so he's claimed divinity by saying he's the one who led Israel up from Egypt, who made a covenant with Israel and who personally called Israel to obedience in verse two, you shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You shall throw down their images, but you have not obeyed my voice. Okay. Not obeyed the voice of the angel, which is clearly, again, this person. The fact that the Lord himself came from the place where the camp of Israel had been, where the tabernacle had been set up, from Gilgal to Bokim shows how serious things had become that he hadn't sent a prophet, he hadn't sent anybody. He came himself to confront the nation about their sin. And so he came up from Gilgal, the very place where they should have gone themselves. <laughs> Remember, we kept saying they should have gone back to Gilgal. H.L. Rossier, uh, in his delightful commentary, says this, At the cross of Christ, in his death, the flesh was absolutely condemned and made an end of for the believer. But continual returning to Gilgal was a necessity. There must be for the believer the constant realization before God that the cross of Christ teaches that the flesh profiteth nothing. True self-judgment must be maintained if we would know wherein lies the secret of spiritual power, by which we mortify our members which are upon the earth. We get this from the victories in Joshua, the Israelites, as we said, always returned to Gilgal. Now, again, could, could I just say, say this, and I, I, I say it to my own heart as much as to anybody else's, but our old life prior to conversion, it was all the flesh. The flesh dominated. And what did it produce for us? Heartache, sorrow, distress, tears. And we came to Christ. And when we allow the flesh to have a place again, do we expect a different result than before? Now I'm a Christian. Is the flesh going to be any more satisfactory, any better for me? No, it's unchanging and unchangeable. And so we must constantly pass a vote of no confidence in the flesh. We can't do God's work in the flesh. We can't live in the flesh. It, it's so utterly destructive, and it always leads to weeping. And so if we fail to get drastic with the flesh, we'll end up in the place of defeat and weeping. So the message of the angel was basically a three-point outline. He first of all talked about how he had been faithful to Israel. He brought them up out of Egypt, all the things that he had done for them. And then he talks about the fact that they, he made a covenant with them. He, he'd been so faithful. And then he says, but you have been unfaithful to me. Because he says in verse two, you'll make no league with the inhabitants of the land. And they were making leagues with the inhabitants of the land. They were putting them under tribute. They were showing them mercy. They weren't following his command. So God had been faithful to Israel. Israel had been unfaithful to God. And yet the bottom line is this, that God would be still faithful to them. Now, he would be faithful to them in a way that he always is faithful to do. And that is this, that he's always faithful to discipline his children. And so in verse 3, he said, Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but there will be a thorn in your side, and their gods will be a snare to you. And so he's bringing upon them discipline. 
And of course, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And it's a mark of sonship. If, if he doesn't discipline us, then we should question whether we're really his, right? Whom the Lord loves. It's, it's, a, it's a mark of sonship. And so, again, just to see this, uh, he, he says, make no league with the inhabitants of the land. Let's just see the instructions concerning this. Uh, he had told them that very clearly back in Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23, verse 32. Exodus 23, verse 32, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. And so it wasn't like he was unclear. He had clearly said to them, uh, when you go into this land, you to wipe them out and you're not to make any covenants with them. Chapter 34, verse 13, it says this, but you shall destroy their altars break their images, cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other God, the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. And we just saw that <laughs> the failure to wipe out Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath, again, they had not obeyed his voice. They'd made leagues with the people of the land and they had gone easy on their religious system and uh, allowed them to continue to practice. And it was going to become, the Lord says, going to be a snare to you. And we're going to see it's not going to be long before they're going to be worshiping their very deities because of their failure to be ruthless. God's faithfulness, I mean, if you want the message of judges in a nutshell, it's God's faithfulness and his people's unfaithfulness. <laughs> That's the message of the book. But we can't escape from the same challenge. In the light of God's unfailing faithfulness to us, are we making leagues with the inhabitants of this land? Are we compromising, settling down in the world, feeling comfortable with it, its values, its ideas, its philosophies? Or are we being ruthless and being separated from it and unto our God? See, the Jews eventually became so accustomed to the sinful ways of their pagan neighbors that those ways didn't seem sinful anymore. Things that initially might have been shocking to them lost their shock value. And they became interested in how their neighbors worshipped until finally Israel started to live like their enemies, and imitate their ways. They were unfaithful within, in their hearts, and ultimately because of that, they fell into the hands of the enemy without. Unfaithfulness within led to them becoming captive to the enemies without. And so, they had departed from the Lord, and so he says, okay, you departed from me in obeying my voice, in following my commands. I'm going to depart from you. In the sense that if they would not drive out the inhabitants of the land, neither would he. So he says in verse 3, wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out. We've just been reading, neither did Asher drive out, neither did Naphtali drive out. So God says, okay, I take you serious. If you're not going to drive them out, I'm not going to drive them out. I'm going to leave them. And so he says, wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and as snares unto you. Their God shall be a snare unto you. Thorns in your side, painful irritants that can fester and be infected if they're not removed. And uh, I know uh, moving furniture, when we moved the house, I got a thorn under my piece of splinter, I guess, under my, my finger. 
And it's amazing how this little thing, I mean, so tiny, I could hardly get the thing out, hardly see it to get it out, but it made my whole finger throb. <laughs> Thankfully, it didn't get infected, but I, I've had it before where they have got infected. And, uh, and so he said, I'm going to make them like thorns in your side. These painful irritants that fester if they're not removed. And the snares, snares are something that catch their targets unaware. And these nations would become that to the children of Israel. They thought they could have the best of both worlds. We can have the land and we can have these people and we'll make them tributaries to us. And uh, we don't have to be so drastic like God wants us to be. And they ended up in a place of defeat. God is not only faithful to bless us, but he's faithful to chasten his people. I want you to look again, please, at, just to see that all we're seeing here in Book of Judges is what God promised. We're seeing his faithfulness uh, being enacted very clearly. Numbers 33 and verse 55. Numbers 3, verse 55 Sorry, Numbers 33, verse 55. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. So again, is God faithful to his promises? Absolutely. Joshua 23, verse 15, Therefore it shall come to pass that all good things that are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. In other words, if you break my covenant, there will be consequences. And you will experience, just as you've experienced the good things, you'll experience my discipline and my chastening. And so verse 4 says, It came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bokim, and they sacrificed therefore unto the Lord. Now this sounds really encouraging, doesn't it? Weeping and sacrificing to the Lord, and it almost seems like, wow, the people have really responded and they've really repented. But sadly, subsequent events will show that it was a shallow and very temporary response. Uh, we could say that it was a sorrow and a weeping because of the consequences of their sin, but not because of the sin itself, because they kept on practicing it, kept on doing it. It, it was not a, a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, never to be repented of. It was temporary. It was shallow. And yes, there was tears. And yes, there was the required rituals. They offered sacrifices. And they went through the motions. But they didn't fundamentally change. And it's easy to relate to this, isn't it? How many times have we been spoken to by the word of God and at the, at the time, felt really convicted about it. <laughs> but what changed? Pretty much went back to normal. And I've seen that happen collectively in assemblies, where God has brought a message to an assembly, and people were stunned, and they were spoken to. And uh, for a moment, it seemed like, oh, this is great. We're, and yet, tragically, uh, it was back to normal in no time at all. And that's tragically what happened to the nation of Israel. Well, we're looking at the failure explained. And uh, the next section from verse six, uh, basically uh, is a, uh, a throwback uh, to uh, Joshua 24. Uh, and it, uh, again, it talks about their failure to pass on the truth from one generation to another. And remember, we talked about the third generation syndrome. And we'll have to wait till next time to consider that. But another reason of their failure was not only uh, 
their compromise, their failure to go back to Gilgal and deal with the flesh, but their failure to pass on the tr vital truth to subsequent generations. And so we're going to see that, but we'll have to wait till next time until we consider that. But may God encourage us this morning ourselves to go back to Gilgal, to remember the God goodness of the Lord, what he's done for us, and to not go easy on the flesh. May God help us in these things. Amen.